بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد My beloved brothers and sisters we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى We praise him We send blessings and salutations upon the most noble of all prophets of Allah سبحانه وتعالى The best of all creation صلى الله عليه وسلم we ask Allah to bless him and his entire household and to bless all his companions and to bless all those through the generations who struggled and strove to learn the deen, to put it into practice, to convey it to others in a way that it has got to us. So this evening we are seated here. Thanks is to Allah. And we ask Allah to bless every single one of us and our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. May Allah keep us steadfast and may Allah keep steadfast for us our offspring in a way that after we pass away, their dua and their good deeds will benefit us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we all know that revelation is not only made up of the Quran, but it is also made up of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in Surah Al-Najm, the opening verses, he does not utter from his own desires, wombs and fancies. Muhammad وسلم, does not utter words from himself just because he wants to say something. It's in fact revelation inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever words he said were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word is the Quran. It is sacred, it is such that those are the exact words delivered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is known as kalamullah, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we were to take revelation in terms of the Quran, some may say that that is the revelation of Allah, the word of Allah. Why then should we adopt something known as the hadith or the seerah or the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what is the purpose of it? Why do we have to follow that? The truth is, the same Quran, if you were to follow it correctly, it will lead you to the following of the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone who wants to read the Quran will find in the Quran words of Allah that not only encourage but instruct those who believe to follow the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in absolutely everything. It's impossible for us, impossible for us to understand the Quran without an explanation by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to know this. There are groups of people today who seem to be saying this is the Quran and that's it. We will only adopt what's in the Quran and we won't take anything else. We won't take the sunnah, we won't take the hadith, we won't take what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has brought. The truth is those who utter these words have not followed the Quran itself. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says quite clearly, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Indeed, they are not considered true believers until they make your decision, the final judgment in their own disputes. And then they find no harm, no hurt, nothing, no ill feeling against that decision. And they actually surrender to it completely. If you're a true believer, you surrender to the decisions made by Muhammad What he declared was halal and haram was not from him, it was from Allah. What we find in the Quran, Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Oh Muhammad وسلم, tell them, if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you love Allah, then do you know what you should be doing? فَاتَّبِعُونِي So follow me, follow me. Where are those who say, don't follow the sunnah? When Allah says, if you love Allah, then tell them to follow you, O Muhammad Whoever loves Allah in the true sense, 
will understand the value of this Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The value of his words, the value of his life, the value of everything that came from him. He was chosen by Allah from the very beginning, the best of creation, the most noble of all messengers. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and upon all the other messengers of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, if you love me, meaning if you love Allah, then follow me, follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah will love you in return. And Allah will forgive your sins. So to gauge if you really love Allah, you need to ask yourself how much of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do I adopt? How much of it do I adopt? There is a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ warns us of a group of people who will come at the end of time. He says, يُوشِكُ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ رَجُلٌ جَالِسٌ عَلَىٰ أَرِكَتِهِ يَقُولُ هَذَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ مَا وَجَدْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ حَلَالٍ أَحْلَلْنَاهِ وَمَا وَجَدْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ حَرَامٍ حَرَّمْنَاهِ The hadith starts off by saying, أَلَا إِنِّي أُوْتِيتُ الْقُرْآنَ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَهِ Behold, I've been given the Quran in terms of revelation. And something similar to it together with it. And then he says, be careful, be warned. There will be people or a person who will come later on reclining on his sofa. Reclining on his reclining chair. Al-Arika is referring to a comfortable chair where you're relaxing, sitting back. And he will say, well, this is the book of Allah. Whatever I find in it as halal, I will consider it halal. Whatever I find in it as haram, I will consider it haram. The Prophet ﷺ says, be careful of such statements. Be careful of those who only consider the book of Allah and want to negate the entire teachings of Muhammad ﷺ that are explanatory of this Quran. It's amazing. Now for us, obviously, we as Muslimin, we do believe that Allah has revealed the Quran and He has also revealed something known as the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Listen to another verse. Allah says, Surah Al-Ahzab. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Indeed, for you, there is a perfect example to emulate and to follow in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, in the messenger of Allah, there is an example. And why would that example have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because for us as human beings, when we read the Quran, we might feel that, you know what, this is for angels, man. You know, this is for really pious people. We have someone who came and showed us how to adopt it by adopting it himself. And this is why we believe the best way of teaching is to lead by example. Even your children, if you want to teach them better than speaking and instructing. Many of us instruct the child, hey, don't smoke. But dad, you smoke a whole, you know, a whole pack of them every day. Dad says, I know what's better for you. Stop arguing with me. Dad, give up the cigarette and say, you know, I used to smoke. It caused so many problems. I've given it up and just watch what I'm doing. It should be enough. May Allah help us. Many of us expect from our offspring things we don't do ourselves. Isn't that hypocritical? So here we have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa telling us very clearly, very loudly, that you know what? Here I am, I'm following what Allah has revealed. And if you follow me, you will be following what Allah has revealed. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's amazing. This is why he is the perfect being sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No blemish, no ill, nothing at all. Allah has blessed him. The most noble of all prophets, the highest of all creation, the first who will be resurrected, the first to enter Jannah, the one who will have the key to intercession by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us as an ummah. May Allah grant us the intercession of Muhammad sallallahu on the day of judgment. And he came to us. We are supposed to follow him. Do you know everything we do, the salah that we just fulfilled now, the adoption of the commands of Allah, the abstention from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we take heed of, the full reward goes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was the source of all that st coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if he taught his companions who then taught the next generation, who then taught the next generation, up to the day it came to us, when I follow something, my teachers, my asatida, those who taught me will have a full reward of what I've done. And their teachers will have a full reward of what they've done. And their teachers and their until it gets to the sahaba and back to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So every word of Quran I read, not only do I get 10 rewards, but all those in the chain of 
teaching right up to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam get a full reward for everything I've done, everything I've said. How amazing, how unique. I always think if we could see these rewards flying, perhaps, perhaps it would be such that we'd all be electrocuted maybe. Subhanallah. So many rewards. Imagine we're sitting, we're all reading Quran and these rewards, 10 for every letter going to whom? To millions of people up the chain, up the ladder. So many are getting rewards for the goodness we do. This is why the hadith speaks of the good example and those who follow the good example, those who lay the good example, the reward they will all be getting. And Allah says, we are not going to decrease your reward. You get 100% of the reward and the people who taught you will get 100% not only of what they've done, but of what anyone whom they've taught have done and anyone who has been taught by those whom they've taught have done and so on. Amazing. This is Allah. This is the mercy of Allah. So keep on teaching the goodness. But the sad part is whoever's taught something bad gets a sin for it and gets a sin for anyone who follows that bad example as well. May Allah protect us from forwarding dirty messages on our phones. Wallahi, it's bad. Sometimes we think it's just an example. It's just something that has come to my mind right now. Sometimes we think, you know what? It's a nice dirty little image. Let's just make our friends laugh. We send it and they send it and they send it. And before you know it, 10,000 people have got it and it came from you. And before you know it, it's so sinful. Why don't you send a good message? Subhanallah. Why don't you send a, send a good message? You know, I received a joke just before I arrived here and I laughed at it and I forwarded it to someone, but we didn't intend any evil. Can I tell you what it was? They say there was a man who met his wife in the kitchen and he tells his wife, he says, do you know what? We've got four children. Which one of them do you love the most? So she says, well, you know, I love all of them equally. These are my kids. I love all of them. Don't even try to make me say anyone's name here. You know, I love all of them. He says, well, I'll tell you what. That's how Allah has made a man be able to love four wives. <laughs> Guess what happened? He got up in hospital. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. May Allah safeguard us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Really. <laughs> So if we understand, okay, we do sometimes want people to laugh, but let it not be dirty. It can be a point of laughter, perhaps something that you, you know, on a lighter note, life doesn't have to be all gloomy. You know, people believe that as a good Muslim, you must be gloomy, you must be somber, no smiling, looking down all the time, you know, wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. You know, that's not a brilliant Muslim. You're supposed to smile, you're supposed to make others smile, you're supposed to say good words, you're supposed to be romantic to the right people. May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. You're supposed to be encouraging others, you're supposed to be making them feel like they are good people. This is the house of Allah. I always say, one of the signs of goodness is when you make others who visit Allah's home comfortable so that they come back because they are looking forward to people like you who give them a smile when they are feeling low, when they are feeling down. You come to the house of Allah, everyone's smiling, you forget your problems. Now it's the other way around. You come in the house of Allah, this guy owes me money, that guy, oh, I owe that guy money, let me run away, duck this side, dive that side. What's all this about? We should not be doing this. Let's follow the sunnah, the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Everything was beautiful. People were honest. Where's the honesty gone? So if we take a look at the Quran, it will lead us to the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like Allah says, you follow this example. This example is beautiful. He is, yes, a human, but the best of all of them. The top of every single creature of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, without a doubt. And at the same time, you follow your love for him and your love for Allah is not determined by a mere statement. It is determined by whether or not you follow what he has brought. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to follow the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when we speak of his example, we hear a few words and I want to go into some of these words to explain to you what they actually mean. You hear the term seerah, don't you? You hear the word sunnah, don't you? You hear the term, for example, hadith, don't you? What is this? What does it mean? Sometimes people say certain things are sunnah and, and they're not sunnah because they are farad. So what does it mean? Let me explain to you. And I'd like to explain in detail because it's important for us to know the difference. And it's important for us to know why exactly we should be following these instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came from the most blessed lips that existed. The lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So firstly, when we take a look at the jurists, and this is the common term sunnah that is used. When you have a faqih or the fuqaha, the jurists, those who speak about what is farad, what is wajib, what is sunnah, what is haram, what is makruh, and so on, the jurists. They have rules of jurisprudence regarding how to read salah, regarding, for example, how to give zakah, and so on. They will tell you, this is farad. Then they will tell you, perhaps, in some schools of thought, this is wajib. Perhaps they will say, this is sunnah. Perhaps they will say, this is makruh. And or they will say, this is haram. According to the jurists, in their own understanding, or should I say, in the context that they use the term sunnah, they are referring to that which is an instruction of Allah, but it is not farad or wajib. So it's an instruction of Allah, not farad, no wajib. Let me give you a beautiful example. We fulfilled Salatul Isha. With Jama'ah, we read something known as farad. The farad was four raka'at. We fulfilled them. Thereafter, there is something that is an instruction of Allah, but it's not farad anymore. It's not compulsory. It is now voluntary because it was that which was added as a voluntary act of worship by the following of what Muhammad وسلم, did and he did not say it is compulsory. So it becomes automatically something you are following, but it's considered sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ did it and he did not consider it compulsory. So that is the context of the jurists known as fuqaha. Then sometimes you hear the term sunnah and people are referring to something farad. Have you ever come across that? From the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to fulfill your salah. What does that mean? So if you take a look at that, we would actually be looking at the context of those who have studied belief. Those who are speaking about belief when they speak of sunnah, the opposite of which is now bid'ah. Have you heard the term bid'ah? So if you hear the term bid'ah, it means an innovation in the deen, an innovation in an act of worship. If it's not an act of worship, that's not the term you use anymore. So if I turn on the light, this was not there at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, electricity, the paint, the cars. Because these are not direct acts of worship, the term bid'ah doesn't go into those words. Because bid'ah is the opposite of sunnah when it comes to belief. If I, for example, believe that salah is not compulsory at all, what am I doing? I've actually found something wrong or there is something wrong in my belief because salah is compulsory five times a day so those who say that this is a sunnah and you're scratching your head and you're saying but how can it be a sunnah it's actually farad the context in which they are speaking is not the context of the jurists it is the context of others and here we're speaking about those who have specialized in matters of belief they would say, this is a sunnah and this is a bid'ah, which means the opposite of a sunnah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Sometimes you hear people saying that, you know what? To give zakah is a great sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu And you start sitting and thinking, hang on, it's a pillar of Islam. It's a farad thing. It's something farad. Yes, it is compulsory. It is wajib. You have to give it. But what they mean is that this is the path of Muhammad sallallahu This is the way. They are not talking of the juristic ruling in, in that regard. They're just talking of the fact that it is part of Islam. It is part of the, the, Muhammad, it is part of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu which means it is part of his life, part of his way and so on. For example, when the historians use the term sunnah, do you know what they are referring to? Something known as the seerah. The seerah means the entire life history of Muhammad sallallahu So people will say, I was reading the sunnah and I found that the battle of Badr took place. What does that mean? That means I was reading the history of Muhammad Sallallahu entire life and I found in it that the battle of Badr took place. So it doesn't mean I was reading something that was not compulsory and I found the battle of Badr. No, it means I was reading the seerah. The seerah actually means a path and a way. Sunnah also means a path and a way. Generally, when we use the term seerah, because it is connected to a road and a path, it is the treading of that path of life. So throughout my life, what I did would be known as my seerah. 
It would include some of your ways and habits and absolutely all of your history or autobiography, whatever you'd like to call it from the point of birth right up to the end. And what would happen is everything would be recorded with Muhammad Sallallahu life. It is by far the most comprehensive record, the most comprehensive record that you have of any human being that of Muhammad Sallallahu Every movement of his. The way he, his eyes moved, the way his lips moved, the way he smiled, the way he dressed, the way he walked. All this is recorded in the books of Sirah, the books of history. The historians have recorded it. When they say this is the sunnah of Muhammad Wasallam, they are referring to his history, his entire life, his biography and all his movements. So much so that even the way he had his fingers mentioned in the Sirah. And then we have the term sunnah that is used also to refer to his words and his actions and his confirmations. Who uses the term sunnah to refer to those? People known as the muhaddithin, the compilers of hadith. They call it hadith as well and they call it sunnah as well. This is why we have, I'm sure you've heard of Sahih al-Bukhari. You've heard of the book? al Jami' al-Sahih. And the person who compiled it is Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. It's considered the most correct book after the Quran. Then you have Sahih Muslim. Then you have Sunan. The Sunan meaning Sunnah is recorded and compiled. By whom? You have Ibn Majah, Rahimahullah. You have, for example, Abu Dawood, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. You have an nasai Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And so on. You have... These people who have recorded the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu they've also called their books Sunan, the Sunan. So the, 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 the plural of the term Sunnah, Sunan. We have recorded them here. They are referring to Hadith. And Hadith would include the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu all of them. The movements of the Prophet Sallallahu all of them. The confirmations, confirmations meaning if someone did something in the presence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if he was silent about it, it confirms the permissibility of that item because it was prohibited for him to remain silent when something haram was happening in his presence. So for example, there was a certain animal, a certain reptile known as a dab in the Middle East. And some of the companions were eating it. A certain type of a reptile known as a dab. And the Prophet ﷺ was silent. So the schools of thought have looked at the hadith and seen that he was silent. So they've said, okay, it's permissible to eat it. Because had it been haram, he would have said, hey, stop eating it. But he saw it. He didn't say anything. No acknowledgement, no denial. It's permissible. It doesn't mean you have to eat the reptile. It doesn't mean it's sunnah because he didn't eat it himself. But it means it's permissible, a specific type of a reptile. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. This is only a simple example to show you that when the term sunnah is used, it refers to so many things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us upon the sunnah. So when we use it in a broad sense, it's referring to absolutely everything we spoke about now. But perhaps in it is something farad that may be included as well. You know, from the sunnah is to abstain from lies. That means lies is haram. That's what it means. But we're using the word from the sunnah is to abstain from lies. From the sunnah is to treat your family members with respect. That's actually compulsory. Did you know that? Today, the way we treat our family members, by far, we are so distant from the sunnah and we claim to be people who follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What's going on? This globe that is in chaos at the moment. If you take a look at the Muslimin, confused lot. Because why? We've turned away from the shining example of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His life, his attitude. When he saw those who were not Muslim, for him, they were potential Muslims. He was so concerned about the guidance being delivered to them that he used to go to them, speak to them, answer their questions. And these were the enemies of Islam. Everyone who's not a Muslim should not even be called a non-Muslim. You know what they should be called? With the hope that we should be having for them to turn to Islam, we should refer to them as not yet Muslim. Subhanallah. These are Muslims and these are not yet Muslim. Subhanallah. What hope is that taught to us by Muhammad sallallahu The minute you say non-Muslim, it's like this is us and this is them. All of us somewhere up the ladder, our forefathers perhaps were not Muslim. They accepted Islam. Today we're seated here. 
the effort of someone. If they looked at us as enemies, where would we be? Would you be seated here? No. Perhaps your grandfather, your great-grandfather, wallahi, from amongst us, there are those who have accepted Islam themselves. Reverts. They've come to Islam. They are purer than you and I who were born Muslim because in a lot of cases, they have seen the darkness and they've come out into the light. But with us, sometimes we have not seen or appreciated the light because we were born in it. Have you noticed when you're in a dark room and the light is turned on, it's a dim light, but you, you are dazzled for a moment and you take a while because the light has really affected you. It's really beaming. For you, it's bright. But someone who is in a very bright room, for him, it's not even so light. He gets used to it after a little while and everything's fine and okay. He doesn't appreciate. He does not realize. For us, when the lights go, thanks to ESCOM, what happens to us? <laughs> we use our mobile phones. We turn on the little screen, which is not even supposed to be a torch. And what happens? The screen lights up and you say, okay, can you see? I can see clearly. But there's no light. It's actually just a screen that's lighting the path. So let me tell you as Muslimin, we should be searching for any light in order for us to see the path. But it's not good enough to just see the path. You need to walk on it. You need to tread it. People are born Muslimin. They know the light, but they're not treading it. Ask those who've seen the darkness and come out of the darkness. They will tell you, Wallahi, the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the sunnah of Muhammad وسلم, is to preach to those, to teach those who are in the darkness, to go to them, to try with them, to answer their questions, to have hope in their regard, to pray for them, to ask Allah to guide them and to guide us all and to bring them to the light in such a way that they don't only see it, but they walk on it. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And this is why when you take a look at the most important dua, the most important supplication in Islam is one supplication that we repeat as Muslims so many times every single day, but we don't even realize. Do you know why? Because we're in the light. We don't even know the meaning of it. We pass it and we're just watch, watching the tune when that thing is read. Do you know what it is? Have you ever considered Surah Al-Fatiha? Have you ever thought what it means? Let's go through it quickly. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The meaning of? That is, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. That's just a simplified meaning. It actually goes far deeper than that. But let's continue. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Most, most beneficent, most merciful. There is a deeper meaning to it. In fact, what it means is, Ar-Rahman is a very broad mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahim is a specialized mercy for those who believe. Maliki Yawmiddin, owner of the day of judgment. Then what do we say? You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. Now I'm about to ask for help. So what's the help I'm asking for? One dua. Surah Al-Fatiha is repeated compulsorily in every prayer without us realizing that there's just one supplication to Allah in that Surah Al-Fatiha. It goes to show that that is the most important prayer ever that a Muslim can make. You don't have water, you don't have food, you don't have drink, no problem. Well, sorry, not no problem, but small problem. <laughs> but if you don't have guidance, very big problem. A person has lost the dunya, this world and the next. So Allah says, المستقيم, Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. Subhanallah. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. That's the dua of guidance. Why the dua of guidance? Because wallahi, a lot of us know salah is farad, but for fajr we're sleeping. We know we're doing wrong, but that's Allah. We say, oh Allah, guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored. It means when you get up for salah, when you dress appropriately, when you abandon your sin, you need to know that that is the path of those whom Allah has favored. Allah has favored those who are guided. Remember this. So if you want to be favored by Allah, make a little bit of an effort. It shows the favor of Allah upon you. I made an effort. But with us, no effort made. Snore, sleep, the fact that there's nothing wrong, we're healthy, we're going to work, we're earning a salary, we got a car, we got a beautiful family, we're going, we're eating and everything happening. Forget about Fajr. It will come the day when I'm sick, when there's a disaster, when my child dies. Astaghfirullah, may Allah safeguard us. Why do we have to wait for calamity before we turn to the Sunnah of Muhammad Why do we have to wait for disaster before we turn? But even if the disaster does come and we do turn, it is still not too late. 
Some of us, disaster comes, we turn for 5-10 minutes and then we go back. May Allah forgive us. But this is the reality. So Allah says, guidance is in the hands of Allah. Do you know when Abu Talib, who was the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu who actually helped and benefited and protected to a certain extent Islam and the Muslims in the Meccan period when they were being persecuted. The Prophet sallallahu really wanted him to accept Islam. And the Prophet says, Ya Ammi, O oh my uncle, say the one statement. Just say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Just say there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. You see, why is it that when entering the fold of Islam, we need to balance both La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Let those who don't believe in the sunnah hear this. We say there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And Muhammad is the final messenger of Allah. That's what we're saying. It is not complete by uttering half of it. No way. It's not complete. You need to utter the next half of it. It is there. Look at the Quran in Surah Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ the surah is named after Muhammad sallallahu and in the surah Allah is saying you should know that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And in surah al-Fath which is the surah of victory you want to achieve that victory in that surah Allah says Muhammadur Rasulullah beautiful beautiful so that entire statement of shahada is mentioned in the Quran. It's there. Both of those aspects are there. We believe that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. We believe the Quran is the word of Allah. But we also believe that Muhammad sallallahu is the messenger and the final messenger. Whatever he says is a message from the one who sent him as a messenger, who is Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the point of saying, I believe he's the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then we say, but his statements are all by the way. Astaghfirullah, a'udhu billah. You believe he's the messenger, do you? How dare you say his statements were irrelevant, or even a single one of his statements were irrelevant? How? May Allah forgive us. May Allah guide us. This is Islam. Here is the Quran telling us that your faith is not complete. If you don't follow the Sunnah of Muhammad if you don't consider him a true messenger, what is a messenger? Have you thought about it? A postman who comes, is he giving you from himself? He's giving you all the letters from whoever sent those letters. So Allah sent a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, chose him because the most noble in character, in conduct, in every aspect of the term nobility, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are lucky. We are fortunate. So the Prophet sallallahu tells his uncle, say the statement and I'll fight your case on the day of judgment. Just say it. The uncle didn't say it because the cronies of Quraysh were standing around, you know, all the chiefs. And they said, hey, hey, hey. You know, you want to go back on the faith of your father. How can you do that? So the Prophet sallallahu was quite sad. When he was sad, Allah revealed a verse and Allah says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ You will not guide whomsoever you wish to guide, O Muhammad sallallahu but it is Allah who will guide whomsoever he wishes to guide. This was only in order to comfort Muhammad sallallahu because he was sad. Allah knows best why what happened happened. And he knows best why what will happen will happen. That's Allah. But this shows you that guidance is in the hands of Allah. So one might argue and say, well, there's another verse in the Quran which says to Muhammad sallallahu Indeed, you are the one who guides to the straight path. So why does Allah say Allah alone will guide? And then he says, you are the one who will guide to the straight path to Muhammad sallallahu it's important for us to know simple answer. A simple answer. Let me give it to you in the form of an example. If I tell you I need to go back to Bokap now tonight, please tell me what's the best route to get there. And you tell me jump onto the N2 and go straight. When you see the road meandering and you see that word Woodstock, be careful because there is a speed trap. <laughs> Am I right? 
<laughs> well, one of the youngsters told me, don't worry, the reel is over. Long time ago, they can no more take pictures. <laughs> wow, we know that much about the speed traps. What about the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prohibitions? We are being photographed. In fact, something beyond photography. We are being completely recorded and then we're not worried. You're speeding to sin and you're not speeding to that which is compulsory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us drive our bodies in the right direction. I mean, at the right speed too. So my brothers and sisters, you tell me the way to go. What did you do? You guided me. Am I right? What was the guidance? Educated you. I told you. I showed you the path. So I leave from here and I decide, ah, you know what? That person doesn't know what he's talking about. Let me go from the back. So now I start going, what do they call it? The M300 or 3000, which takes you all the way that behind some way there. You end up in Mitchell's plane. <laughs> and then I say, but hang on. What was that guy saying? He didn't tell you this. He told you something. He guided you. You did not follow the guidance. So going back, Muhammad وسلم, is definitely the guy. He guides to the straight path. But whether or not the people will follow the path is in the hands of Allah. Simple. So he is a guide. He will guide. And Allah says, you are the guide to the straight path. And then Allah says, but whether or not they will adopt the path, that's in our hands. Don't worry. Your duty. This is why Allah says so many times to Muhammad وسلم, in alayka illa al Indeed, your duty is none other than to convey the message. You conveyed it, that's your duty done. You know, when we see children and so on, you tell them, hey son, stop doing this. He says, firstly, I'm not your son. Secondly, even my dad doesn't talk to me like that. And thirdly, who are you to talk to me? <laughs> that's what they do today. A'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. They want to punch you. Who are you? You're not my dad. Astaghfirullah. So then what do you say? Old man say, hey, son, I was only, I told you you're not my son. I'm not yours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The attitude, why this attitude? My beloved children who are seated here, who may be listening to this later on, don't have that attitude. Appreciate those who correct you. Wallahi, it is the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only to correct, but to appreciate correction. Do you know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa being the perfect being that he was. Allah planned certain things in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in a way that they happened not because they were to be a fault of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but in order for them to be a lesson for us all. To say that part of perfection is to accept correction. Remember this. Part of perfection is to accept correction. You know, we have the opening verses of Surah Abbas. Abbas wa tawalla anja'ahu al-a'ma wa ma yudrika la'allahu yazzakka. The Prophet ﷺ, he frowned and he turned his face. So Allah says, he frowned and he turned his face. When the blind man came to him, so some people out of their love of the Prophet ﷺ, they say, no, that didn't ever happen. So we say to them, hang on, there's a verse of the Quran that says it's happened. And there is not only one hadith, but so many authenticated narrations that are undoubted, that have proven that it did happen. So don't say out of your love that it did not happen because then you're denying something that's in the Quran. But rather than that, understand why it is there. It's not there in order to show that the Prophet ﷺ made a mistake. No, it's there so that Allah says you follow the sunnah and the path of the messenger, you won't need anything else. So one of the things that people would have to go through is correction and the way you react to correction. Did the Prophet ﷺ get angry when Allah revealed those verses? He was the one who read it. If he wanted, he would have covered it and said, hey, listen, this verse didn't come down. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> but he was the messenger. He recited those verses. There are more than that. There are so many examples. I've only given you one. So out of our love of Rasulullah we say, indeed, he was perfect. And Allah chose for that to happen, not for him, for us. So that the lesson can come to us today. We, no matter how perfect and brainy and intelligent you think you are, when someone corrects you, you need to nod your head and thank them. Subhanallah. And you know, they say intelligence comes with arrogance when it is not checked. You think you're too clever. That's what they say to you. And you really do think you are. May Allah forgive us. Those who are very bright, they don't like to be told. Because why? That's the bright spark. But you also make mistakes. You can be very intelligent, but you lack wisdom sometimes. Let the wise train you. 
A lot of us have too much of knowledge, but we do, we lack wisdom. So how to disseminate that knowledge, we don't know. And we think we know because we're too sharp. Here comes Abasa wa Tawalla to teach you a lesson. To say, hang on, no matter who you are, here is the best of creation. He acknowledged, he changed in the sense that he greeted Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum. He gave him importance. He understood. He recited the verses. So every one of us learn an example, learn from that example. Imagine if that wasn't there. People would say, okay, I'm following the Prophet ﷺ in everything, but there is no example of when, when you corrected how you should take the correction. That's why when I started this example, what did I say? Part of perfection is to accept correction. Beautifully. That's the sunnah of Muhammad ﷺ. Here we are. My brothers and sisters, what a beautiful life. You lead a life of happiness, a life of contentment, because that was the messenger. Take a look. If Allah wanted, Wallahi, He could have given Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the keys to the treasures of the entire dunya, all the gold and silver, the platinum and what have you, everything would have been in his hands and everything would have been at his disposal. He would have given him absolutely everything, but Allah chose for him a life that was not the life of the haughty and the wealthy. It was a simple life. He went through difficulty. He went through years when they had nothing to eat. They were eating the leaves of a tree. I don't think any one of us have eaten the leaves of a tree. Unless they folded with Indian spices inside called pan. <laughs> I had to think of it quickly because you know, people start objecting there. No, I do eat leaves, but you're eating it as a luxury. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. My brothers and sisters, we are so fortunate and then we say Allah doesn't love me. Why? Because you know I eat beef every day, but I haven't been able to eat beef for the last four days. Allah doesn't love you. The most beloved unto Allah, no beef, no chicken, no nothing. Aisha radiallahu anha says, In kunna ala Muhammadin. Even though we were the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a month passed, we saw the moon, we saw the moon, we saw the moon thrice. In huwa illa tamr wal ma. It was only dates and water. Three months. Never once did they say, Allah doesn't love us. They were happy. They were delighted. With us, you lose your job. Three months, you have no salary. You start doubting. Allah, astaghfirullah. Where is the perfect example? This is where the sunnah comes in. Go back, look at his life. Check what he did. Look at what Rasulullah had. It will open your heart. It will open your doors. It will open your mind. It will make you see and appreciate the little that you have. He was the best. He used to engage in salah, not just the farad. But he used to stand at night until his legs were swollen. And his wife, radiallahu anha, used to ask him, O oh messenger, you are the best, you are the greatest, you are forgiven completely, meaning perfect, sinless, spotless. How come you were standing at night until your feet are swelling? He says, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Shouldn't I be a slave who's thankful to Allah for what he's given me? The more he's given me, the more I must be in salah. Amazing with us, the more we have, the further we've gone. They say those who have a lot of wealth, no sin have they not left. That's not true when it comes to the true believers. It may be true for those who don't know Allah. Let's turn to Allah. Brothers and sisters, you want to thank Allah. Allah has given you much more. In terms of material wealth, Allah has given you much more than a lot of the companions of Muhammad Do you know that? But there's no barakah in what we have. There's no blessing. Because ingratitude, and when we say, I'm grateful, that's all. Someone says, how's business? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Have you heard that? <laughs> how's business? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Brother, what does that mean? Is that your grat gratitude? You're not there for salah. You don't know what salah looks like. Come Ramadan, only Allah knows what happens. Does Allah forgive us? <laughs> How is your business? You say, you know, we definitely do thank Allah. I'm not saying don't say Alhamdulillah. It's a beautiful answer. But mean it. Mean it. Let it come from inside. Because the Alhamdulillah should be showing by you being there for Salatul Asr. That's what it is. By you being there for Salatul Fajr. By you dressing appropriately. By you abandoning sin. The zina is so easily committed. You cut it. You say, no ways. Oh Allah, I thank you. Business is okay. Others are struggling. The economy is turning downwards. You know that. We all know that. Throughout the globe. People are suffering. Everything is crashing. Right or wrong? Things are becoming more and more expensive. Business is not as it used to be a few years ago. Zimbabwe is now coming right. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So what happens? You need to thank Allah. He's still giving you. He's bestowed upon you. He's given us so much. Really he has. That's Allah. My brothers and sisters, this is the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu What a beautiful life. We follow it. We understand the various categories of the term sunnah. We will definitely follow as best as we can. We will definitely take cognizance of the fact that certain things are compulsory. Certain things are not compulsory, but recommended. Certain things are permissible in totality, known as mubah. Permissible completely certain things are detested and certain things are totally prohibited We need to know that in terms of jurisprudence and in terms of the juristic rulings and when it comes to matters of faith we know that certain items are taught by Muhammad Sallallahu acts of worship they will be known as sunnah those acts of worship not taught by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are the opposite of the term sunnah the opposite of it in that context would be bid'ah and the same applies when it comes to the life and the history of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I call on you to read on it I tell you what I was taught by one of my own mashayikh one of the teachers who taught me he says whenever you are in difficulty go and open the pages of the biography of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah will create ease for you because when you read it and you know that this is the best of creation and look at how much they suffered you will realize hey hey you know what this is not the punishment of Allah we are quick when something goes wrong your factory burns down people say yeah Allah punish that guy Allah punish who are you did Allah come to you telling you that I'm gonna punish this man that now suddenly you know that that happened not at all so we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness and ease and we we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors my beloved brothers, really, it was an amazing evening that we had here. I've spoken for 46 minutes, 13 seconds exactly. By now, it's probably 16 seconds. <laughs> and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity. We have a brother who would like to, inshallah, embrace Islam. Uh, I think he is here with us. And perhaps if the brother can get up and come forward, inshallah, we would like to uh, get the declaration of the shahada, inshallah, as we've spoken. And we make dua for him and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and to bless one and all. And my brothers and sisters, while the people who are not yet Muslim are looking at the goodness of Islam and seeing it and reverting in their thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, we who are already Muslim, let us rejuvenate. Let us open up. Let us revisit the teachings of Islam with the idea of adopting it. It's not good enough to say, I know. Wallahi, there are people who are jealous of us. They want to pull the carpet from beneath us. They want to snatch away our deen. It's the biggest gift that we have. Let that not happen. Learn it. Adopt it. Follow it. Put it into practice properly so that when your children see, when the rest of the Muslimin see, when the youth and the young see, they see your contentment, your happiness, your enjoyment, your balanced lifestyle. And they realize that this balance, this goodness, this enjoyment within limits is actually what is taught by Islam. And that is what will bring us true salvation in this world and the next. Barakallahu feekum. Sorry? You want to do a few announcements? Okay. Inshallah, we will close for a few moments. The brothers want to make a few announcements and then we'll take the shahada. If the brother is not, uh, for example, prepared to come and stand in front of everyone, sometimes there's a bit of stage fight, although there's no stage here. But no problem, we can do it later on, inshallah, perhaps somewhere towards the back. Jazakumullah khair.